Welcome to the Orange Couch. I'm Mark. I'm Amanda. And this is Mad Men, Season 7, Episode 1, Time Zone. Are you ready? We open with Freddy delivering the pitch of his life. And in the best OMG moment of the episode, we later learn he's reciting words that Don fed him. The show was unusually on the nose, har har, about one of its themes. Why don't you stop this Cyrano bit, march your ass in there and get us both a job. There's a lot going on with the concept of imitation or substitution in this episode. Lou standing in for Don, Joan standing in for Ken, Ken standing in for Pete, L.A. Bagels pretending they have anything to do with real bagels, Don trying to replace Megan's crappy little TV with a big shiny one, since Don always picks flash over sensibility, Nev Campbell standing in where Megan will be in 10 years if things don't change, and obviously Freddy imitating Don. And don't forget them stealing the most famous shot from The Graduate, too. But imitation slash substitution wasn't the real theme of this episode. It's actually something you called the busted door problem when we were watching it. What do you mean by that? Well, the most obvious symbol of it is Don's actual busted door. It's when something is wrong or broken, but for whatever reason it's not getting fixed, and so you end up just living with it. With Don and Megan, they can hardly speak out loud the problem they're both clearly thinking about, which is that their marriage is broken and they don't know how to fix it. Almost every character is facing something that's busted, but how they choose to deal with it differs. Like Don and Megan, some characters are simply ignoring what's broken, like a clogged toilet you don't have time to deal with. Roger is in this camp. He's living as sexually liberated a lifestyle as you possibly can, and it's clearly as exasperating as it is exciting. That's not the look of a man who feels free, but he's just shoving the problem to the side and trying to get some shut-eye. The whole creative team, except Peggy, seems not to notice that Lou is a terrible head of creative. Don was failing to do his job in the months before he left last season, but Lou is so bad that you practically want even bad Don back. And he certainly can't hold a torch to Don when he's actually doing his job. Lou overlooks bad work, pushes for mediocrity, seems out of touch and indifferent, But everyone laughs and goes on like it's no thing. As you say, the only person resisting the lame jokes and terrible taglines of Lou Avery is Peggy. Instead of ignoring her problem, she's one of the people trying to fight it. No one wants things to be better? I got it. I'll just stand out here all by myself. She tries to play by Lou's shifting rules. She tries to lay on the charm. And when all else fails, she goes into open rebellion, hoping to spring an ambush at the client meeting. Unfortunately, battle has a cost, and at the end of the episode, Lou's left happy as a clam, and she's alone and sobbing, desperate for an ally. No big surprise that Joan is the other person trying to fix stuff, since she, like Peggy, has always gone above the call of duty at her job. When it seems that Butler Footwear is leaving Sterling Cooper, Joan goes through a lot to bring them back, including reaching out to a business professor for advice. Her plan, of course, works, and we discover that Joan would make a great account executive. But just as Peggy gets dismissed, Joan gets an earring thrown at her. Not a coincidence that it was a symbol of her gender that was used to put her in her place, either. A big part of the reason both Peggy and Joan can't seem to get anywhere with their hard work is they're working with a bunch of men who don't respect women's intelligence. Don is fighting against being put out to pasture by sneaking in Freddie Rumson with good ideas that suggest Don's creative spark has been relit. Megan warns him not to rip out ads from her magazines, so clearly he's been devouring inspiration. It's possible that Peggy has a secret agent aiding her in her war against Lou, but I'm not sure Don's resistance is a good thing. As Freddie Rumson says, by not acknowledging the reality of being booted from the agency, Don risks becoming damaged goods himself. Maybe it's time to just accept the truth. In fact, the characters in this episode who actually seem mentally healthy are the ones who have decided to just let it go, baby, it's dead. Though none of them run off and build an ice castle as a result of it. Margaret has finally made peace with her father by accepting that the past cannot be changed and she's wasting energy just constantly fighting with him and trying to punish him over and over for past misdeeds. Well, when all is said and done, I forgive you. And with all the jokes about how Ted, another guy ignoring what's broken between him and Peggy, should be Tanner, it's Pete who waltzes into frame with a tan and a tennis sweater. After losing his turf war with Bob Benson, Pete is small time now, but he's not ashamed of it. Remember when all he wanted were airlines and cars? Now he's crowing about landing modest local restaurant chains. 
The first week, I signed eight salt fish and chips. Four stores. Pete has a new girl, he's looking for a new office and a new apartment, and he's slowly building the business Don and Stan dreamed about at the end of last season. And so we're left with a final shot of Don sitting outside, staring at the broken door that's letting all the cold in, unable to do anything about it, but also unable to, you know, sleep in the cold. All of which suggests that Don may not really have learned anything from recent events and is just going to keep creating problems for which there is no easy fix. So who will be the first to make a major life decision and shake things up this season? Maybe we'll find out next week on The Orange Couch. <laughs>